Hey there, today we are going to talk a little bit about muscles. All right, so. All right, so let's talk a little bit about muscles. So the muscular system pretty much consists of all of the muscles in the body. There are three major types of muscles, and those are the skeletal muscles, the smooth muscles, and the cardiac muscle. So the first thing I want to do is just talk a little bit about these three different types, what we think of them and how we compare them, and then we'll get into some of the details that mostly end up relating to the skeletal muscle, but a little bit to the smooth. So if I wanted to examine the three of these, one of the things that I might do is compare them in a Venn diagram. So I am a huge fan of Venn diagrams. And in this case, because there are three muscle types, whoop, I'm going to make three circles. So what's the key that makes all of them essentially the same? Well, I mean, okay, they're all muscles, that much we know. But the other thing that makes muscles the same is that they all have filaments made out of proteins. Those proteins pretty consistently uh, contain actin and myosin. Now their arrangement might be different in different ones, but these are true of all muscles. So this will be the all muscles section. Um, and so we can say made of filaments and proteins actin and myosin, if that makes sense. The other thing is that they all have one physical movement that all muscles are capable of doing, which is contraction. All muscles contract. The whole point of the proteins is that no matter how they're arranged, they contract. Sometimes we call that pulling. So the physical action that muscles do is pulling. So all of these are for that. They all tend to be involved in some kind of movement, although we'll get to specific muscle functions later. So that's all muscles. So this is the stuff that would technically, if I had a little bit more space, go right smack boom, in the center of this Venn diagram. Okay, and now let's get a little more specific. So as I've done before, when I do this, I like to look at each one separately. So let's start with skeletal muscles. Well, what's key to skeletal muscles? Well, they are attached to bones. That's what makes them skeletal. So they're kind of interesting in that way that they are attached to bones. The other thing that's interesting about skeletal muscles is that they are what we call voluntary. Voluntary, I can spell. Meaning that you decide to move them. They require some aspect of the somatic nervous system to move them around. So that's a key, very important concept. All right, so those are the main things that make skeletal muscles skeletal. Let's consider smooth muscles. Smooth muscles are typically found around organs. That's the place that you find them. Now that is a little bit broad, but it is fairly literal. So they're around the organs that need to move. They're also around things like vessels. So I'll include that because it's actually a good one to remember. So around organs and vessels, because this would allow vessels to increase and decrease most of the time. One of the things that makes smooth muscle distinct, as is the name smooth, is that Protein fibers have essentially a intermixed organization. So instead of all the fibers going the same direction, they essentially crisscross. They don't always do it exactly the same way, but that's sort of one of the things that makes the smooth muscle unique is the crisscrossing of the fibers. All right, and our final type of muscle is cardiac, and cardiac muscle is really distinct because it is found in the heart. Just one place, nowhere else found in the heart, so it's heart muscle. It's also got another little neat 
thing, which are gap junctions that are specifically in this case called intercalated, if I can spell that correctly, discs where the signals can travel from muscle cells to muscle cells so they can signal themselves, which is important in the heart because you need the heart to beat consistently and together, but you can't have a nerve jump to each and every one of them. Oh, that's another important all muscle thing is that in some form or another, all muscles are activated by nerves. But in the case of the cardiac, you only have to activate some of the muscle and then it can signal itself. For the skeletal and the smooth muscles, you actually have to activate each muscle fiber in some form by the nerve. So that's important. All right, so now we can do the comparisons where we say, well, what's similar or different about different groups of them? In some cases, these comparisons come up pretty quickly and easily. So for instance, we noted that skeletal muscle was voluntary. Smooth and cardiac muscles are both what we would call involuntary, as in you do not get to control them. They are controlled by other portions of your nervous system. Typically, they are involved in, for example, your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which decide if your heart beats faster or slower, as well as your organ movement, like digestion and things like that. All of that is involuntary. You do not choose how to move those muscles. One of the things that makes smooth pretty clearly delineated from the other two, which is why it's called smooth, is that the other two are what we call striated. That means all of their muscle fibers actually go in the same direction. So when you look at these muscles, they look like long strips of muscle fibers, and that's important. And then finally, for the last comparison, because in this one, I can do all of them, cardiac muscle is only found in the heart, whereas skeletal and smooth muscles are found throughout the body. And I think that's also a key concept that you find them pretty much everywhere in all honesty or pretty close to everywhere whereas cardiac only in the heart so this would be a good comparison of the three muscle types right, the next thing we're going to talk about are the functions of muscle so obviously based on what we mentioned one of the key functions of muscle because the job the muscles do is to contract is movement muscles help to move things and that's really important for the body now they have three jobs and two of them are related to each other. So the first one is movement. The second one is actually directly related to that. And it is, it has a couple of different terms that are used for it. I like to say that it's movement and stopping things from moving, which is resisting movement. Sometimes the word stability is used instead. Essentially the idea is that other things are constantly causing our bodies to move. For example, gravity. So my head is honestly pretty heavy. If I had nothing holding it up, it would fall over to the ground. It's heavier than most of the rest of my body. But it stays upwards because I have muscles whose job it is, is to keep my head from moving. So they're pulling against the motion of gravity. You have lots of stability muscles that are pulling against the motion of gravity at any given time. So they're not necessarily moving but they are contracting. And if I keep my head upright all the time, it will eventually make my contracting muscles tired and they will not want to do it anymore, which is why at the end of the day, you feel like you just can't. And then the third job that your muscular system has is back related to both of these because anytime you move, there is an energy relationship going on. And that means that you are producing spare energy, or in this case, heat. Your muscles produce the vast majority of the heat your body needs, which helps to keep us in this warm-blooded state of always having a little bit of heat. So every time your muscles move, they release some energy as heat. All right, so those are the main jobs of the muscular system. All right, let's consider the complete, essentially complete structure of the muscle from small pieces all the way up to big pieces. So the muscle is made of two filaments. They are actin and myosin. I'll make the actin these thin blue lines because actin is the thinner of the filaments. There we go, and bring some actin lines. And then I will draw myosin as a larger um, redder piece because it is the thick filament. This is my junky muscle, but you know, it's the way it's set up. 
Later we'll dive in and see how these two interact, but mostly this is how they're built. And then this segment that you see here is actually repeated essentially right next to it. So there'll be more actin, I'm gonna run over my words here, and also more myosin. And these are each little pieces that are next to each other. So remember we said that they're strided because they look like they're in long strips. Well, that's what you've got here. So we have the thick filament myosin, thin filament actin. And when you put them together in these segments, they make sarcomeres. So this, here is a sarcomere and it's right next to another sarcomere and we lay the sarcomeres all along edge to edge to edge and when we do that we create what is called a myofibril and notice things that relate to the muscle are start with myo most of the time so myosin myofibril in the case of actin it's because it acts or it moves and so that's related to that all right so this is the very 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 inside of a muscle cell at the tightest level but in fact, there are many, many myofibrils in a muscle cell. So I'm gonna get rid of this stuff and draw that a little bit more sort of distinctly. So if I have myofibrils, I might have myofibril, 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 myofibril. So all these little protein fibers stacked together, and they actually are inside vomb of a complete muscle cell. And since this is a muscle cell, it also has other things. For example, it might have a nucleus, or in fact, muscle cells typically have a bunch of nucleuses because they come together and have a bunch of those. They probably also have, because muscle cells need lots of energy, a bunch of mitochondria. You won't be able to see those quite as well, but I'm gonna draw them in so you can think about it. But this is a muscle cell. It has many myofibrils. So muscle cell, or sometimes called a muscle fiber. Now this is where things start to get confusing because we call the proteins themselves fibers, and then we call them stuck together fibers, and we call the muscle cell a fiber. But it's important to keep track of which one is which. And inside the muscle cell are the myofibrils and all of that. And that's still not enough because one muscle cell is not gonna be enough to move anything, so I need to put a bunch of muscle cells together. All right, so I'm gonna move this over here. So we start at the, the tiniest things and we're getting to bigger things. All right, so I'm gonna delete this, and now we're gonna talk about just muscle cells. Well, I'm gonna have a whole bunch of muscle cells that come together. So here's a muscle cell, and it's next to another muscle cell, and it's next to another muscle cell, and you get my crappy drawings of muscle cells. And they need to work together, so they need to be tightly bound. So we bind them together with some connective tissue. So here's me taking some connective tissue and binding them together. The connective tissue that binds it together is called fascia, and that's the connective tissue. And the whole thing together, we have two names for what we either call a muscle bundle or a fascicle, because it's bound together with fascia, which is the connective tissue. So that is now the next size up of useful things is the fascia or muscle bundle. And even that's not enough to make an actual muscle. We need to take a bunch of muscle bundles and put them together to make the actual muscle. Whew, so by the time we're done, we've put together a lot of different stuff. So the whole muscle is actually the biggest item and it is made of a whole bunch of fascicles. So now I've got these sort of bundled items and I'll put it next to another bundled item and I'll put it next to another bundled item and all of that comes together to make what we think of as a muscle. And of course your muscles don't even work on their own most of the time. You do have some singular muscles that work on their own, but for example, to lift my arm up like this, that takes two muscles because it's a bicep. To straighten it like that, it takes three because it's a tricep. And my legs, that quadricep has four. So you see lots of muscles all over the place. And they also don't work on their own. Don't forget to then connect 
to the bones, they're going to need something else, which is typically a tendon. So it connects from one bone to another. Usually one bone is the one that kind of stays still and the other one is the one that moves. So in the case of the bicep, it's going to connect to the top of the humerus and that stays still. And then it also connects to the radius and the ulna, thump, which allows me to bring my arm forward. So that is your whole muscle structure from the filaments all the way up through the muscle. So now let's get into a little bit more detail about how these muscles actually work. I actually have this neat little gif that is probably one of my favorite things that I've used to talk about muscles in the past. So the problem with the gif of course is that it circles around and it just keeps going back and forth so I'm going to wait till it loops back to the beginning and kind of show you what you got here. So these, this here is your muscle or at least this is very very zoomed in on the muscle. It's zoomed in on the muscle fibers and specifically is zoomed in on the actin here and the myosin here. So the actin is the thin filament, the myosin is the thick one. You can only see part of those because they are thick. Number one that happens anytime a muscle moves, as I mentioned before, is actually the action potential or the nerve signal. So the first thing with muscle movement is that you have to have a nerve signal. And there's a specific neurotransmitter that is generally involved in this nerve signal, and that is acetylcholine. I remember that from the nervous system. So the acetylcholine goes between the nerve and the muscle through the neuromuscular junction. I know, right? You would almost never have thought that that would be the name of something, but that's pretty much a biology thing for you. So the acetylcholine travels across the neuromuscular junction and it tells the muscle it's going to do something. So then what happens? Well, the next key thing is that what this does is it actually tells the muscle to release calcium, which you can actually see is happening right now. So calcium is released into the muscle fibers. So it is almost always surrounding the muscle. There's plenty of calcium in the sarcomere or the sort of connective stuff that's holding the muscle together. But the acetylcholine tells the calcium to be released into the muscle. And the calcium attaches to the thin filament or the actin. Now when the calcium attaches to the actin, it changes the shape of it just a little bit. So it attaches to actin and changes shape or a conformation, which is sort of how we talk about proteins being built. So the calcium goes in and it changes the shape. This shape change allows the myosin to interact with the actin. It couldn't do it before, but it can now. It has these funny little heads. And what happens is the myosin heads can attach now to the actin filament and they are able to kind of grab hold and connect to a spot in the protein where they could not connect before. So the calcium allows the myosin to connect. Now what? Well, now the muscle actually needs to do this movement thing. And that happens once the heads connect. So here it's actually happening again. The calcium is connected. The heads are connecting. The next step is that energy, ATP, is used to pull the actin. So the myosin heads move in such a way that allows the actin filaments to shift and they typically come towards each other, thus we call it contracting. And this leaves ADP. So ATP is turned into ADP. ATP is useful energy, ADP is used energy. And then interestingly enough, the final step is actually that the myosin has to disconnect and that's not really mentioned overly here. So the myosin disconnects, which actually takes more ATP. That doesn't always have to happen immediately. So you can use ATP to continue to the motion, or you can use ATP to release the motion, because your muscles can hold. So I can hold something up with my hands and keep those muscles tight, which is called tetany, or I can release them. This whole process, by the way, from the nerve signal all the way through the disconnection is what we would call a muscle twitch. And it's not necessarily like a ooh, fast twitch, although we'll get to those. It's just one full circulation of 
the muscle and how it connects.